Welcome everyone to probably the most important video of this series. Today, we'll be integrating end-to-end -end video calls between users over network. This video is quite long, but it will cover everything that is required to create a video calling app. By the way, for your convenience, I've also dropped some timestamps in the description, so you can utilize those as well. So without any further ado, let's get started. We are going to do a lot of things in this video. And to be honest, there are so many ways in which you could implement video calls over network. I'm not talking about the number of libraries, no, they might just be a handful, but I'm talking about the approach. There might be some SDKs now or maybe in the future which will handle a lot of the tasks. But in case of Agora, even though it handles majority of the work, there are still few things that we'll have to implement ourselves. For example, pickup screens. It would have been amazing if Agora provided those as well. We'll have to implement those and a few more things ourselves. Remember, everything we'll do can be done in various approaches. So you don't have to necessarily stick with mine for your future projects. In fact, it took me around 3 to 4 iterations before I landed on this one. Every approach I took earlier had its own problems. This approach has problems too, but it suits our needs and the problems are almost negligible. Alright, first things first, I'll head over to Android Manifest and paste these permissions. You can get all these from the Agora RTC documentation page on pub.dev. Next, I'll add Agora RTC engine and permission handler dependencies. I would really suggest you to work with the same versions of dependencies for this project, which is 1.0.8 for Agora and 3.0.0 for permission handler. Also, I faced this error on my machine when I ran the code with latest version of permission handler. I think it's because of some SDK license issue. I resolved it by downgrading the dependency version. Or you could upgrade your SDK tools. Now that the permissions and dependencies are out of the way, we'll move on to creating a new model. Just create a new file inside model folder and name it call.dart. Then inside the call.dart, I'll simply create a class called call. Now every call object will have a caller ID, a caller name, and caller pick. Similarly, we'll also need receiver's details, so it will have receiver ID, receiver name, and receiver's pick, or receiver picture. And finally, the most important element would be the channel ID. So I'll write string channel ID. Channel ID is gonna be a unique identifier that we'll maintain for both caller and the receiver. And we'll retrieve this channel ID on each end and pass it to the corresponding user's Agora SDK instance. Right, and one more property that we'll have is gonna be has dialed. Now has dialed is a boolean value, which is gonna be true for the dialer or the caller and false for the receiver. We basically need this in case we wish to show a different UI or perform different actions for caller and receiver. After that, I'll initialize everything inside of the class constructor and right over here, I'll create a function called doMap. We have done this a lot of times now. So doMap will expect a call object as an argument and we'll simply map the call object into a map and return it back. Similarly, we'll declare named constructor by writing call.fromMap and it expects a variable of type map to be passed as an argument and it simply maps that map variable into a call object. We are going to be using this call object a lot in this video. It's time for us to make another file called callmethods.dart inside the resources folder. Callmethods file will contain all the functions which carry out call related backend operations. Oh, and I would also like to talk to you about the way we were calling the methods present inside of the Firebase methods file. So whenever we needed to access a function of Firebase methods, we first created an object of Firebase repository class and then used that to call the functions of Firebase methods class. It's a good approach, but I realized that it does not scale well. And that's why I will not put any of the call related methods inside Firebase methods file, even though call methods talk to Firebase. In the future, I'll probably create a video where we'll extract out the authentication related backend operations from Firebase methods file and put them into a separate file. So first, I'll make a collection reference right over here and call it call 
collection and set it to firestore.instance.collection and pass call collection. Call collection is just going to be a constant string global variable. So head over to strings file and just create this variable and we'll set it to call representing the name of our call collection and create a function called make call of type future of type bool. If you're new and sort of confused with this whole future bool syntax, it basically means that we'll return a future and if someone on the other end awaits for that future, then they'll receive a boolean value. For example, if I simply create a function called future bool abc, mark it as async and then return true. So what this means is that when I'll call this abc function and when I await for it, it will simply return a boolean value. Alright, so let me remove that. Now this function will receive a named argument of type call with the name call. I'll mark it as a sync. Now we'll create two different map variables. I'll call the first one has dialed map and the other one has not dialed map. And I'll set both of them to call dot to map call. But you might wonder that if both are set to the same thing, then what's the difference? Well, right before has dialed map, I'll set call dot has dialed to true. Whereas just before has not dialed map, I'll set call dot has dialed to false. Now you can easily guess that has dialed map should be sent to caller's document and has not dialed map should be sent to receiver's document. I'll write call collection to target the call collection, then document and we'll target call dot caller ID. Then for setting the data, I'll write set data and since it's the document for the caller, therefore I'll pass has dialed map. Then just below it, I'll write await call collection dot document call dot receiver ID dot set data and pass has not dialed map. After that, I'll wrap everything in a try catch block. And if everything works perfectly, then we'll return true or else we'll print the error and return false. So that was the make call function, which maps the call object and sets the data. Now I'll make another function called end call with the same return type and set of arguments and mark it async as well. This function will only be responsible for deleting the documents. So I'll write await call collection dot document. Then we'll target the document of our choice. The first one will be call dot call ID and call the delete function on it. Similarly, I'll just copy the same line and target the receiver ID document this time. And that's it. Again, I'll wrap everything in a try catch block and return true if everything happens normally or else print error and return false. It's time for us to make two very important screens. The first one will be the pickup screen, whereas the second one will be the call screen. I'll create a new folder inside screens and name it call screens. Then I'll create a file and call it callscreen.dar. Then I'll create another folder called pickup. Inside the pickup folder, I'll create pickup layout and pickup screen.dar files. By the way, let me clarify that pickup layout is not going to contain some UI component for pickup screen. It's going to be a completely different widget. But for now, I just want you to focus on the pickup screen. Now pickup screen is going to be a stateless widget and it will receive a call object as an argument. So I'll declare call object right over here and initialize it inside of the constructor. Then for the build method, I'll return scaffold body and in the body, I'll pass a container, set its alignment to alignment.center, give it some padding, maybe uh, edge insets.symmetric, set it to vertical 100. Then for the child, I'll pass column, set its main axis alignment to main axis alignment.center, then children. The first child is simply going to be a text widget which will simply say incoming and I'll give it some style, set its font size to 30. Then I'll pass a sized box of height 50. I'll write image.network and pass call.callerPick. Then I'll provide some height and width to the image.network widget. I'm just doing this for now. Soon we are going to replace this image.network widget with cached image widget. 
Alright, so just below it, I'll again create a sized box of height 15, then write text, and this time we wish to display a caller's name. So I'll write call dot caller name. Then for the style, I'll simply set its font weight to font weight dot bold and font size to 20. Then again, we'll show a sized box of height 75. So right after this sized box, I'll create a row, set its main axis alignment to main axis alignment dot center, children. Now the first child is going to be an icon button and for the icon I'll pass icon icons dot call and color set the color for the icon button to colors dot red accent and for the all pressed I'll write async await call methods dot end call and pass the call as a named argument. Of course we haven't created an object of the call methods class so far. So I'll scroll to the very top of the file and write final call methods call methods equal call methods. So just below this icon button, I'll write size box width 25. Icon button. This time I'll set the icon to icons.call and set the color to colors.green. Then for the on pressed, I'll write navigator.push context pass a material page route object, then builder context and finally return call screen and pass the call object as a named argument. We're about to define the call screen widget. And once we do so, make sure to import the necessary file. Let's move on to creating the call screen. Now call screen will be a stateful widget, which will take a call object as an argument. Therefore, I'll declare a final variable of type call and name it call. And I'll initialize it instead of this class constructor. For now, we're not gonna integrate Agora directly. I want to take this one step at a time. So temporarily, this page will only have a column and two children. The first one is going to be a text that says call has been made. And the other one is going to be a material button with color set to red. For child, I'll simply pass an icon widget, which takes icons dot call end and set the icon color to white. Finally, for on pressed, I'll simply write on pressed. Then instead of the curly braces, we just need to call call methods dot end call function and pass the call object that we receive as an argument. After that, I'll write navigator dot pop context to pop out of this call screen. Let's attach all of this functionality to the video call button in the chat screen. In order to make a call, we'll have to create and initialize a call object, then pass it to the make call method and handle the response that we receive from make call. Doing all that in a single on pressed method would make the function more cluttered. Therefore, I'll create a file inside utils folder and name it call utilities.dart. Now I'll create a class called call utils, declare static final variable of type call methods and initialize it. Then I'll create a static method named dial. Here the return type doesn't really matter. The dial function will receive three named arguments. First one will be a user called from, representing the caller. Then the next one will again be a user called to, representing the receiver. And finally, a context. I'll mark this function as a sync. Next, I'll write call call equals call and start initializing this call object. So I'll set the caller ID to from.uid call a name to from.name and call a pic to from.profile photo. Similarly, I'll set the receiver ID to 2.uid, receiver name to 2.name and receiver pic to 2.profile photo. For channel ID, we wish to generate a random number between 0 to 1000. So I'll write random.nextint and pass the range which is 1000 and this returns an integer. So I'll convert it into a string by calling the toString function. Practically or in real world applications, you would want to generate a random ID which is more secure and robust, such as a randomly generated alphanumeric string. After this, I'll declare a boolean variable called callMate and it will store the boolean response which is provided by callMethods.makeCall after awaiting it. I hope this clears that future bool return type syntax now. One thing that you can notice over here is that we have not specified the has call property for our call object. 
Well, that's because the make call method sets the has call property on its own. So we don't have to do anything over there. But right after calling the make call method, I'll set call.has dial to true. In this way, the call screen will be able to determine the difference between a caller and a receiver. All of this might sound a little gibberish until you see it all being implemented. And finally, I'll write if call made, which means that the documents were successfully created in the database, then we would want to navigate to call screen. And I'll pass the call object as an argument. Now I'll finally go over to the chat screen, search for icons.videocall. For the on press of this icon button, I'll return call utils dot dial set from to sender, which represents the current user, set to to widget dot receiver, which represents the user we are talking to. And finally set context to context. Before I move any further, I just noticed while editing the video that I made a mistake. The current UI of the call screen makes the text and the button appear on the top left corner, whereas we want them at the center. In order to get the desired UI, I'll set the main axis size of the column to main axis size dot minimum, then wrap it with a container and set the alignment of this container to alignment dot center. Let's test this. I launched the app on my device and now when I tap on the video call icon, I should be taken to the call screen. And in the console, a new collection called calls should appear. There we go. It contains the desired documents. When I open them up, the first one is for the caller. You can see that the has call is set to true, whereas the second one is for the receiver. And both the documents have the same channel ID. So on the receiver's end, we can use the receiver's ID to look into his specific document and retrieve this channel ID. I'll be doing that just in a moment. Let's also test this hang button. As soon as I tap on it, these documents should go away. And yes, they do. Perfect. It's time to start working on the receiver's end. In order to display a pickup screen, we'll make use of a stream builder widget that constantly listens to any changes made inside of current user's document in the call collection. And for that, I'll head over to call methods and define a stream of type document snapshot and name it call stream. It expects a named argument called UID of type string and it will return call collection dot document. Then we'll pass the UID to listen to the changes in the current user's document. Then we'll call snapshots. In order to swap between the pickup screen and normal screen, I'll head over to the pickup layout. We'll create a stateless widget and name it pickup layout. Then I'll write final widget scaffold and initialize it over here. We'll also need an object of call methods class. So I'll declare it right over here. Then I'll come inside of the build method and start with returning a stream builder of type document snapshot. For stream, I'll write call methods dot call stream UID. But how do we get the user ID? Well, you can receive current user as an argument for pickup layout widget, but I don't want to do that. I would rather create another provider which can provide us with user object anytime, anywhere in the entire app. In order to create a provider, just go over to provider folder and create a new file called user provider. I'll just copy and paste the content. So we have a class called user provider which extends change notifier. Then we have created a private user object which can only be accessed with the help of this getter known as get user. And then the refresh user method refreshes or initializes the user object by fetching the latest user details from Firebase and notifies the listener. You can see that there's an error and that's because we have not defined this method. So let me quickly create a function in Firebase methods with the name get user details. The return type for this function will be future of type user. I'll mark it as a sync. Then I'll write Firebase user current user equal await get current user. Finally, I'll write await user collection dot document, pass in the current user's ID, and then I'll call the dot get method. And this returns a document snapshot. So I'll set it to document snapshot type variable. Finally, I'll return user dot from map. And as an argument to the from map method, I'll pass document snapshot dot data. 
Then I'll scroll to the top and define a collection reference with the name user collection and set it to firestore.collection user collection. Now I'll define the same function in the Firebase repository, which in turn calls get user details of Firebase methods. It's time to register this provider. So far, we have only registered a single provider called image upload provider. In order to register multiple providers, I'll make use of another widget called multi provider. And this accepts a list of providers. So first I'll pass image upload provider. And secondly, I'll pass user provider. And that's it. The providers are now registered. It's time to go back to pickup layout. Then I'll come inside of the build method and start writing final user provider provider equals provider dot off context. Now to specify the type of provider we are looking for, I'll write type user provider. Then finally for UID, I'll use the getter get user from user provider and retrieve the UID. On the surface, it looks like everything will work, but it won't. We'll need to employ some failsafes. So right over here, I'll write if user provider is not null and user provider dot get user is not null, then we'll return stream builder or else we'll return scaffold body center. And for the child, I'll pass circular progress indicator. So basically if user provider and user provider dot get user objects are null, then we would simply want to show a circular progress indicator. Although get user will still contain null value. And that's because we have not called the refresh user method anywhere. The best place to call this method would be inside of the home screen, which any user visits by default every time they log into the app. So I'll go inside of the home screen and at the top, I'll write user provider, user provider. And now we'll call the refresh user method inside of the init state, as we want to read the database only once when the home screen is loaded. Therefore, I'll initialize the user provider by writing user provider equal provider dot off context and set the listen property to false. Finally, I'll specify the type by writing user provider. Then I'll call user provider dot refresh user. There's still an issue over here. Init state is called even before the first frame is drawn, which means that no context is available at first. That's why the framework will throw an error. In order to get around this, I'll wrap everything with a post frame callback. In order to create a post frame callback, I'll write scheduler binding dot instance dot add post frame callback. Now I'll copy everything from above and paste inside of the body of the callback. Great. Now I'll go back to the pickup layout and write builder, which returns with a context and a snapshot. First, I'll check whether the snapshot has data and the data that it has is not null. If it's not, then I'll map a call object from that data by writing call dot from map and pass snapshot dot data dot data as an argument and set the result to call variable. Now we'll return a pickup screen and pass the call object. In the else part, which is accessed when the snapshot does not has any data, I'll return scaffold. It's time for us to make use of the pickup layout. So I'll go over to home screen and wrap the scaffold with another widget called pickup layout and pass the complete scaffold widget as an argument. Let's test it and I'll let you know how everything is working. Oh, and here, instead of checking for snapshot.data, we need to check whether snapshot.data.data is not equal null. I have launched the app in two devices and I've also launched the Firebase console in the background. Now, as I tap on the video call button, we are moved to the call screen and we get to see a pickup screen on the receiver's end. If you look at the pickup layout, we are listening to any change in the call collection document of current user. And we check whether the snapshot has data or not. So initially, when there are no documents corresponding to current user's user ID in the call collection, snapshot returns with a null value. And that's why we see the scaffold widget or the home screen. Whereas when a person calls the other person, two new documents are created corresponding to the caller and the receiver. And now the value returned by the snapshot is no more null. Therefore, the stream builder displays the pickup screen. 
Watch what happens when I tap on this call end button. The corresponding documents are deleted and once again, snapshot returns with null value. There are still some issues over here. Let's list them. First, the pickup screen will be shown for both caller and the receiver. Why is that? Well, that's because both the users have the same stream builder working for them. And we create two documents, one for the caller and other for the receiver. Therefore, snapshots returned by stream builder widget for both the users start returning non-null values at the same time. Therefore, both the users will see a pickup screen. Obviously, we don't want that. So I'll go over to the pickup layout. Here, we need to find a way to differentiate between a caller and a receiver. And we can do so by making use of the has dial property of call object. If you remember, has call is true for the dialer and false for the receiver. So I'll employ a check that if call.hasCall is false, only then do we need to return a pickup screen or else we'll simply return widget.scaffold. That's it. The first problem is solved. After this test, our goal is to find a way which makes the user experience more lenient. Here's what we want. When the call is made, the caller is obviously on the call screen, whereas the receiver is on the pickup screen. Now, if the call is cut or hanged by dialer, then the end call method is triggered, the documents are deleted and the pickup screen on the other device goes away. This works fine, but the problem occurs when the caller has made a call and the receiver hangs up directly from the pickup screen. In this scenario, the end call method is triggered, the documents are deleted once again and the pickup screen goes away. But the issue is with the caller. The caller is still stuck on the call screen. We need a way to pop the call screen when the call is hanged from either end. And for that, we'll make use of the stream that we defined earlier. First, I'll create a user provider, user provider. Then I'll create an instance variable of class stream subscription and call it call stream subscription. Now I'll override an init state method and write add post frame callback. Let's define this callback method. So right over here, I'll create the method and start it by creating an add post frame callback. The callback returns with a void argument. Then inside the callback, I'll start by initializing the provider and set the listen parameter to false. Now comes the important part. I'll write call stream subscription equal call methods dot call stream for the UID I'll write user provider dot get user dot UID then upon this call stream method I'll call the listen function which returns with a document snapshot. Here we are listening to all the changes which are being made to the corresponding users documents. Then I'll write switch ds dot data and the first case we'll make is gonna be case null. Again we are doing the same thing. So ds.data is null, which means that the documents are now deleted and the call is hanged. Therefore, we would want to pop out of the screen by writing navigator.pop context. And just below it, I'll write break. Then for the default case, we don't really want to do anything. So I'll just write break. You might wonder why didn't we use an if block? We could have just checked if ds.data is null. And if it was null, then we could have simply called navigator.pop context. Well, here's the issue with the if block. If block does not prevent execution of code. What does that mean? Well, when we delete the document in the database, sometimes the stream is triggered more than once, which means that the snapshot returns with a null value more than once. And in that case, an if block would have triggered navigator.pop more than once, which would cause the user to land on a black screen. Switch, on the other hand, prevents extra code execution with the help of the break keyword. So no matter how many times the stream returns null, we'll only check for the very first time, pop out of the screen and break the execution of code. Now I'll override the dispose method and call the cancel method on call stream subscription. Let me quickly make another change. I'll go over to cached image file and replace the complete code with the updated one. So why did we do that? Well, we have just made it more customizable. So now we can adjust height, width, border radius, and so on. We've also given this widget an ability 
to show a default image when the provided URL could not return with a response. Now making this change would certainly break something in our app. For example, in this case, chat screen shows some error. So I'll go over to chat screen, search for cached image. So now the URL is not a named parameter anymore. So I'll just pass the message.photo URL as a non-named parameter. And now we'll also have to set some height and width. So I'll set the height to uh, 250 and width to 250 and then give it a border radius of 10. So I've launched the app in both the devices. Just so you know, I'll call the left device as the first device and the right one as the second device. And by now you already know how everything works in the console. So I don't think there is a need to show that anymore. Now I'll search for a contact on the second device, select it and then tap on the video call button. Right after tapping that button, I land on the call screen and a pickup screen is shown on the first device. Perfect. Let's test whether the hang works perfectly or not. First, I'll try to hang the call from the receiver's end or the first device. And there we go. The pickup screen disappears from the first device and the second device pops out of the call screen. I'll try to call once again from the second device. And this time, I'll hang the call from the second device itself. Once again, the pickup screen and the call screen disappear in the desired manner. Now I'll reverse the test. So this time, the first device calls the second one. A pickup screen appears and now I'll actually pick the call. Then I'll hang the call from the second device. And everything should work just fine. Similarly, if I call once again and this time, if the first device hangs the call, everything still works perfectly. Great. Now let's actually start integrating the Agora SDK in our application. By the way, if you've enjoyed the video so far and learned cool new things, then don't forget to show your support by subscribing to the channel if you're new or else liking the video. And now let's start integrating Agora SDK in our call screen. So the very first thing that I would like to do is to show you basically what Agora looks like and how to get your API keys and uh, register your project. By the way, I covered all these things in much more detail in one of my previous videos. So you should definitely check it out by clicking on the top right corner of the screen. In order to integrate Agora SDK in your projects, you would want to get an API key from their dashboard. So if you go over to agora.io, this is what their homepage looks like. And this is basically their login page. It's pretty simple. And then this is the dashboard. Of course, if you want to create a new project, you can just click on create give some name to your project and select either of these options. And once you click submit, it should create that project for you and show you this app ID. Next, we are going to need to copy and paste some code. So if you come over to the pub.dev documentation page for Agora RTC engine, you'll see that in the example tab, they have provided this code for integrating or getting started with Agora SDK. Although personally, I don't really prefer to copy and paste anything from here. I would rather search for Agora Flutter GitHub and the top link that comes is from Agora IO community. Now what I'm going to do is just clone this entire repository or download it as zip and open it up in the VS code. All right. So this is what it looks like in the lib folder. We have got SRC and the main dot art. There's not really much to explain. Let me just copy and paste the important part. So first of all, there's a utils folder instead of which there's a settings dot dart and this is what contains your app ID. So what I'll do is I'll go over to my folder and just inside the lib folder, I'll create a new folder called configs, then a new file with the name agora configs dot dart. And then I'll simply create a string app ID. And this is where you're supposed to paste the app ID that you copy from your Agora dashboard. At this moment, I'll just copy and paste one of my previous projects API key. And then I'll go over to call dot dot because this is basically the main thing. Then I'll also come over to call screen. And what I would want to do is just drag this call dot dot over here and divide the screen in two displays. Also, let me just get rid of this activity bar to get some more room. Okay, so let's start copying. 
first of all i'll come over here copy and paste these three uh, variables just like that then inside of the init state they have this initialize function so i'll copy that as well and i'll name it something like initialize agora and then i'll just copy and paste this whole function Now what this function does is basically it initializes your Agora instance. Now there are several missing functions and values. First of all, let's get the app ID from our Agora configs file. Then we have to get init Agora RTC engine. So let's find the definition for this function, which is right over here. So we'll copy this and paste it just over here. In this file, we have not imported the Agora RTC engine dependency. So I'll just click on this bulb and import the Agora RTC engine library. After that, we need to get some Agora event handlers. So I'll just copy and paste everything. I'll explain all the necessary things, so just bear with me for a moment. Now here comes the most important part. So there's this function called await Agora RTC engine dot join channel. This is what is responsible for joining your caller and the receiver to a specific SDK channel and we would want our caller and sender to be joined to the same channel. I'll make use of the call object that we receive in the argument and get the channel ID from over here and pass it to Agora RTC engine. So basically when a caller makes a call, he goes to this call screen with a specific channel ID and joins the Agora SDK instance first. Then the same channel ID is passed to the receiver via the pickup screen. They also move to the same call screen widget with the same call object which has the same channel ID. And this is how the receiver also joins the same channel as that of the sender. And the video call commences. Now it's time for us to work on the UI of our call screen. So I'll go over to the build method, copy this and the background color, move right over here to the scaffold and just replace everything from everything we just copied. Just like that. Now we need to define a view rows widget, which is present right over here. So I can just copy and paste that from over here. Then we need to get expanded video row, which I can copy and paste from here. Then we need video view. So I'll just copy and paste that as well. And what else? We need get render views. Again, copy, paste. There's a lot of copying and pasting required. Okay, so view rows is complete. Now we need to cover panel. This panel is basically responsible for showing us some essential logs. We will remove this widget when we are done with testing and we are ready to generate an APK. So I'll paste all that. And finally, the only thing that is left is the toolbar. Toolbar basically contains all your control widgets such as the mute button, call end button, and switch camera button. Now we need to define on toggle mute, so I'll just copy that, paste it over here, on switch camera, on switch camera. Now in this case, we don't really need to copy this on call end. I'll just remove that from over here and write call methods dot end call. And for the call, we'll pass widget dot call. When this button will be tapped, the end call method will be triggered. The documents present inside the call collection are deleted, which causes the user to get out of the call screen automatically. Okay, now the only thing that is left is to copy the dispose method. So I'll just copy everything from over here and paste it right over here. So we have copied and pasted pretty much everything. Now the only things that are worth explaining are these callbacks. You can get a list of all these callbacks by just writing our RTC engine dot on and there we go. These are the number of callbacks that you can receive for various types of events such as on user joined, on user mute audio, on video size changed and so on. So let's talk about the first one on error which is basically triggered when there is some sort of error. After that, there's on join channel success. On join channel success is triggered by the first user who joins the channel. The caller will be the first user 
who will join a specific Agora SDK channel. Then the second on user joined is triggered when the receiver joins the same channel or any other user who joins after the host triggers on user joined. Then there is on updated user info. If for some reason uh, user info changes in the same session, then there is on rejoin channel success. This is usually triggered when a user leaves and joins the same channel due to some network connectivity issue. After that, we have on user offline, which occurs when a user suddenly leaves the channel uh, by pressing a back button or if suddenly he drops offline. In fact, we would want to cut the call if a user suddenly presses the back button. So right inside of this callback, I'll write call methods dot end call. And for the call, I'll just pass widget dot call once again. Then there's on registered local user. Even I'm not completely sure what that is used for. And then there is on leave channel, which is triggered when someone leaves the channel. Then there is on connection lost on user offline, which are all pretty self-explanatory. And then we have on first remote video frame. This is basically triggered when the very first frame of the video call is drawn. In order to access camera and microphone, we'll need to ask the user to grant us that access to the hardware. So I'll come over to the utils folder and create a file called permissions.dart. Then I'll simply paste the complete code. You can find this code from the GitHub repository linked below under the same project structure. There isn't much to explain as well. It's quite simple. We've defined a static method which returns a future of type bool. Then we basically check for camera permission status and microphone permission status. If both the statuses are set to permission status dot granted, which means that the user has granted access to camera and microphone, then the function returns true or else we handle the rejection by throwing a platform exception error and ultimately return false. There are two functions which are basically responsible to check the permission status. And if the permission is not already granted, then they display the grant permission pop up to the user. It's time for us to call this method and we'll need to call it right before the user is navigated to call screen. First, I'll head over to chat screen, go to icons.videocall and right before the arrow, I'll write async and after the arrow, I'll write await permissions dot camera and microphone permissions granted and if this permission returns true then we'll call the call utils dot dial method or else we don't want to do anything we'll do the same thing on the pickup screen as well first i'll mark the function as sync and await for the boolean result returned by permissions dot camera and microphone permissions granted and if the result is true then the user should be navigated to call screen or else we won't do anything Let's go for one final test. All right, I have launched the app once again. I'll dial from one device, pickup screen appears on the other. And now when I tap on the receive button, the app asks for permission. I'll grant the necessary permissions. There we go. The actual end to end video call over the network has finally commenced. You can test all these controls for yourself. And if you run into any problems, then feel free to open an issue regarding any part of the code on this project's GitHub repository. At the moment, the pickup screen only appears when the user is on home screen and nowhere else. In order to change that, just wrap all the screens with pickup layout widget. And then you'll be able to see the pickup screen no matter where you are in the app. I'll make that change in the code before pushing it to GitHub. Now I'll simply cut the call. So technically, this tutorial or video should just end here. Although I would also like to cover another issue. The video call works right now. But if you build the release APK, the app suddenly crashes when you try to call someone. You can find the cause of this issue at the documentation page of the plugin. Under the heading Android release crash, it says the error is caused by code obfuscation because Flutter sets android.enable rate equal true by default. At the following line in the app slash progardrules.pro file, to prevent code obfuscation. I've linked an article from the Android's developer website which addresses the same issue. So if you wish to collect more knowledge on this topic and ProGuard files, then you should definitely check that out. For now, I'll just go over to build.gridle, present inside the app directory, and scroll to build type, 
release, I'll remove these comments. Now I'll copy and paste these lines one after the other from the official documentation page of Android. First we set minify enable to true, then shrink resources true and finally I'll copy and paste this. This line is the solution to our problem. You can see that there are two files being referenced over here. First is proguard android optimize.txt and the other is proguard rules.pro. You don't really need to care about the first one but it's the second one that we'll need to focus on. So I'll create a new file called proguard rules.pro and make sure that you create it just inside the app folder. After that, I'll paste some of this default content and I'll go over to the documentation page, copy this line and append it right over here. While packaging the APK, this file prevents the code for mentioned classes from being obfuscated. Now you are finally ready to build an APK and talk to your friends over video call. That's it. We have finally added end-to-end -end video calling over network in our Flutter application. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned lots of new and cool things. Tell me about your thoughts on the video in the comments down below. Also turn on the notifications to get notified of the latest uploads at the earliest. Oh, and I've also linked an APK for everything we did today in the description below so that you can test it on your own device and see how it all works. The code for this video is linked in the description below. In the next video, we'll take a look at how to populate the chat list in the chat list screen so that a user is able to see everyone they have messaged. So that's it for this video and I'll see you soon. Till then, stay safe and keep fluttering.